Our final speaker for the conference is Professor uh, Murray Ray, who is Professor of Theology at the University of Otago in New Zealand. Uh, he was first trained as an architect, uh, craft, which he had for many years, uh, and is in, reflected in his most recent work, Architecture and Theology, The Art of Place, Baylor 2017. He completed his PhD at King's College under the supervision, I believe, of, of Colin Gunton, who uh, also became a personal friend, so I'm sure this, this talk is personal to him today. Um, he's published widely in the area of, of modern theology, including history and her hermeneutics, TNT Clark, 2006, Kierkegaard, and TNT Clark, 2010, as well as a name that has come up several times in this conference, Critical Conversations, Michael Polanyi and the Christian Theology, uh, Wiffenstock, 2012. Today, Professor Ray will be lecturing on Colin Gutton's account of the doctrine of creation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ray. Thanks for your introduction and for the warm hospitality you've offered on behalf of the Henry Center here. It's uh, much appreciated. Um, I didn't, in fact, spend a lot of time with Colin Gunton at King's College, but he wasn't actually my PhD supervisor. That was Alan Torrance. Colin was, in fact, one of my examiners rather than uh, supervisor. So my purpose in this paper is to explore the Christian doctrine of creation as presented by the 20th century theologian Colin Gunton and to consider the relation of that doctrine to the enterprise that we call modern science. I'll begin with a brief account of Gunton's understanding of the theological task, present a summary of his doctrine of creation, and then explore four key issues concerning the relation between theology and science. The mystery of all lives lies in their contingency. With those words, Colin Gunton begins an account of his own theological development. Each of us, he continues, is born, lives, and dies at particular times and places, and these contingencies shape the kinds of people we are. Gunton himself was born in 1941 and died in 2003. He was an English theologian, but not a typical one. Raised within the Congregational Church rather than the Church of England, Gunton referred to himself as a dissenter. He dissented especially from the prevailing disposition in English theology during the time of his theological education at Oxford, in which theology had been subjected more or less willingly to norms of thought drawn from outside its own proper calling and sphere of responsibility. In the 1960s, those norms were drawn especially from science and from a particular conception of science determined by post-Enlightenment rationalism. Theology, it was thought, must conform to the conceptions of truth and knowledge delivered by the Enlightenment, and especially to the view that through and only through the proper exercise of human reason, there could be obtained an objective and impartial grasp upon the nature of reality. This modernist heresy, as Gunton called it, issued in the quest for a purely secular foundation for knowledge, which amounted to a human attempt to displace God as the source of being, meaning, and truth. The widespread acceptance of these constraints amongst English theologians of the mid-20th century resulted in a loss of proper confidence in the foundations and central content of Christian faith, namely the incarnation the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. According to Gunton, it is this historically contingent reality given by God and made accessible to us through the work of the Holy Spirit that determines the very essence of Christian faith and constitutes the subject matter to which Christian theology must attend. Undaunted by opposition to this resolutely theological understanding of what theology is and how it should proceed, Gunton devoted himself to the pursuit of theology determined in content and in method by the self-disclosure of the triune God. His theological career may be characterized, I suggest, 
as the joyful pursuit of the possibilities that emerge for life and for thought through faithful attention to this subject matter. Now, while attention to the incarnation and to the life, death, resurrection and ascension of Jesus was for Gunton the proper subject matter of theology, theological inquiry necessarily involves conversation with all other spheres of human inquiry. That is because Christian theology is not a merely personal or marginal interest alongside of which, but essentially independent of it, we may also pursue other interests and inquiries. The Christian gospel, rather, is universal in scope. It makes a claim about the nature and purpose of the universe, about the totality of things and the way they are constituted in relation to God. The task of theology, therefore, has a bearing upon all of our human endeavours, including, not least, our scientific endeavours. This universal scope of the theologian's interest is evident in Gunton's claim that the doctrine of creation is that which provides a common foundation for all the human enterprises we call culture. Not just theology, but science, politics, ethics and art as well. So let us turn to Gunton's exposition of that doctrine. The first thing Gunton wants us to notice about the doctrine of creation is that it is a matter of belief. It is expressed, first of all, in creedal form. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. That observation is not a promising beginning for those still wedded, of whom there were many among Gunton's contemporaries, to an enlightenment ideal of what counts as truth and knowledge. But Gunton is undeterred. The creedal expression of the matter shows that the doctrine of creation is not something self-evident or the discovery of disinterested reason, but part of the fabric of Christian response to revelation. But otherwise, the doctrine of creation is not derived from a detached and impartial observation of nature but as the fruit of careful attention to God's self-disclosure through the Word and the Spirit. The appeal to Revelation is of interest not only because God's self-disclosure is the proper ground of all theology, but also because Revelation plays a part, in fact, in all our knowing of the world. There is a givenness of things to which we must attend, and to which we must allow our minds to be conformed. The language of revelation is appropriate in science as well as in theology. Science proceeds, as its best practitioners attest, by allowing the reality with which it is concerned to be itself and so reveal itself. To be sure, scientists approach the object of their investigations with a whole range of prior concepts, and they often engage in all kinds of experimental manipulation of those objects in order to test the degree to which the object under investigation conforms to those prior concepts. But true inquiry is undermined if the inquirer supposes that the object must be wholly accommodated within the range of concepts which we already have available. Genuine inquiry requires openness to the possibility that our conceptual frameworks may require modification or even replacement in light of what is shown to them or to us by the object itself. The reality of the object, in other words, precedes and must be allowed in principle to subvert our prior classifications of it. In all spheres of human inquiry, we must allow our minds to be conformed to the reality with which we are concerned, rather than insisting that the reality under investigation conform to our prior concepts. Gunton's confidence in this account of our cognitive engagement with the world is strengthened by his reading of scientist and philosopher Michael Polanyi, who's already been mentioned. 
Polanyi contends that if we are to understand properly what goes on in our knowing of the world, we must recover the teaching of St. Augustine, that all knowledge is a gift of grace. Polanyi insists further that our quest for knowledge and understanding always takes place under the guidance of antecedent belief. Augustine is again invoked, unless you believe you will not understand. Like theology, scientific endeavour rests upon a series of beliefs about the nature of things, about their intelligibility, the trustworthiness, though not infallibility, of particular communities of discourse, the sharing of a cultural heritage, and so on. Polanyi explains that no intelligence, however critical or original, can operate outside such a fiduciary framework. So the creedal foundation of the doctrine of creation, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, does not involve some special pleading on behalf of theology, Gunton insists, but brings to light an essential feature of all our knowing of the world. The second feature of the Christian doctrine of creation to which Gunton draws attention is the idea of creation out of nothing, creatio ex nihilo. The idea of creatio ex nihilo is not explicitly affirmed in scripture, but relies instead upon the numerous scriptural affirmations of divine sovereignty. That sovereignty is absolute, and so is not constrained by forces or things that precede God's creative act, or exist independently of it. The absolute sovereignty of God entails that no such forces or things exist. This means that God does not create the world in the manner of a potter, for example, who, while exercising creativity, imagination and freedom, is nevertheless constrained by the inherent properties of clay. The Christian notion of creatio ex nihilo teaches that the work of divine creation has no such constraints. God is utterly free in bringing the creation forth. Now that is not to say that there are no antecedent conditions that determine the form and character of the created order. But these conditions are not external to God. Rather, the character and form of creation are determined solely by God's love. This enables us to affirm, following the divine declaration in Genesis 1, that creation is very good. Now, the notion of creation out of nothing enables us also to say, uniquely in the history of human thought, that the world is neither eternal or infinite. It has a beginning in time and will also have its end. Putting these two affirmations together, we may say both that the world is the outcome of God's love and that its telos, or true end, lies in the full realisation of God's loving purpose for it. I'll say more in due course about what this means for science. But first we need to explore some further entailments of the idea of creatio ex nihilo. To say that the world is solely and completely the outcome of divine love is to say that it is the product of God's will. Gunton demonstrates the importance of this affirmation by showing the perils that have ensued in theological tradition when it has been denied or insufficiently stressed. He's particularly concerned at various strands in theological tradition that fail to distinguish God's being from the exercise of God's will. This can result in a blurring of the distinction between the being of, the God, the being of God and the being of the world, the product of divine will. For reasons we need not go into in any detail, Gunton finds Origen, the third century theologian, to be guilty here. Origen is in danger of proposing a hierarchical gradation of being in which spirit is preferred over matter. This gradation begins with the divine word's emanation from the Father in such a fashion that the word or logos 
is a little less divine than the Father. The, world, the word's first creation thereafter is the incorporeal world of rational spirits who subsequently fall away from God and only then are clothed with bodies so that they may be preserved while they, they develop their spiritual capacities once more. The result is a hierarchy in which the spirit is elevated and the body is denigrated. Other theologians of the early church saw the danger in Origen's blurring of the distinction between divine and creaturely being, and between spirit and matter, and, he sought to count, and they sought to counter it. Important especially are Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nyssa, and John Philipponos, among others. These theologians insisted that there is only one fundamental division in being, that between the creator and the created, between God and everything else. As Harold Nebelsick explains, particularly in relation to John Philipponos, this insight into the nature of things is of momentous importance. I quote Nebelsick, following his perception that God was responsible for the creation of the whole universe, Philipponos was convinced that the cosmos as a whole was composed of the same kind of matter and was subject to the same laws. Hence, in direct opposition to prevailing thought, he both rejected the dichotomy between the finite earthly and the infinite eternal heavenly realms and recognised the importance of earthly reality. Heavenly realms here refers to the planets and stars and so on. Philipponos' Christian insight set him apart from the world of classical thought, but not, of course, from scripture. The biblical story of creation in Genesis 1 insists upon precisely the same point, namely that the heavenly realms, in particular the sun, the moon, and the stars, are not divine beings, but are created alongside all others of God's creatures. The heavens are made of the same stuff as earthly realities, and none of them are divine. This opens the way to scientific, that is to say, empirical investigation of what created realities consist in and how they behave. Gunton thus explains that without the doctrine of creation out of nothing, which affirmed the rationality, contingency, and non-divinity of the material world, the rational and experimental techniques which have brought such immense enrichment of human culture simply would not have been. Now the question of whether modern science could have arisen elsewhere or have taken the particular form it has in cultures not shaped by the Christian doctrine of creation, I leave to one side. The salient point is that scientific endeavour is not in itself antithetical to a theological construal of the world, but depends, in fact, upon beliefs that Christian theology articulates and provides a basis for. One more point must be treated within this discussion of creatio ex nihilo, namely that the world has a beginning and also an end. To confess that the world is the product of God's will and that its form and character are determined by divine love, is to say that it has some purpose. God has created with an end in view. Now, Gunton repeatedly stresses that eschatology is intrinsic to the doctrine of creation and not a separate field of theological deliberation. There is, Gunton says, no creation in the beginning without an eschatological orientation. From the beginning, it has a destiny, a purpose. Creation is out of nothing in that it is made both to be and to become something. Not something else than what it is, but something perfected, able to praise and give glory to God for what it has been enabled by him to become. Simply put, creation is a project it is a project initiated by God and that will in time be brought to fulfilment by God. But it is a project established for the sake of the creature and in which the creature is called to participate. 
Note well here, however, that because the form and character of creation are determined by divine love, our participation is not coerced, but enabled. Not unlike the way a child may grasp a parent's extended hand as they embark upon some project together. The child's act is freely undertaken, but made possible in virtue of the parent's love. Creation is, on this account, the space and time given for the creature to grow up in love for its creator. Gunton here appeals to the second century theologian Irenaeus, who, as we will see further shortly, is the theologian upon whose influence Gunton's account of the doctrine of creation depends most profoundly. Irenaeus's eschatology is distinctive on account of his insistence that although good, Adam is not created perfect. That is why, for Irenaeus, eschatology, the final fulfilment of God's creative purposes, cannot be conceived as a return to some ideal state imagined to have existed in the beginning. Eschatology concerns instead the full realisation of God's purposes to be worked out in time and space. As Gunton puts it, for Irenaeus, that which comes from nothing is destined to become something. One way of speaking of that which humanity is destined to become is to say, as the orthodox tradition has often done, that humanity is called to become the priest of creation, gathering all things into communion with their creator. Another part of the Christian story tells of how we have failed in that responsibility, but that it has been taken up and exercised for us by Christ and in a way that restores the possibility of our sharing through the Spirit in his divine calling and appointment. The connection in Irenaeus between the divine project of creation and the tragedy of human sin is explained by Douglas Farrow. The love for God, which is the life of man, cannot emerge ex nihilo in full bloom. It requires to grow with experience, but that, in turn, is what makes the fall, however unsurprising, such a devastating affair. In the fall, man is turned backwards. He does not grow up in the love of God as he is intended to. The course of his time, his so-called progress, is set in the wrong direction. That's Pharaoh. <clears throat> Commenting upon this passage, Gunton explains that redemption or salvation is that divine action which returns the creation to its proper direction, its orientation to its eschatological destiny, which is to be perfected in due course of time by God's enabling it to be that which it was created to be. Now this leads us to the third and the most distinctive claim of the Christian doctrine of creation, namely sorry, to Gunton's most distinctive claim about the Christian doctrine of creation, namely that creation is the work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, I've pointed out already the importance, I've pointed out already the importance for science of upholding the relative independence and ontological distinction of the creation from the creator. The world is not in any sense divine but has its own distinct existence. Precisely because God does not need us, therefore, for the realisation of his own being, we may affirm the freedom and the value of the creature in its own right. That God is wholly other raises the question, however, of how God and the world are related. By what means does God bring the world into being and continue his relationship with it? The progress and success of science in the early modern period persuaded some thinkers of the time that the world's operation according to natural laws left no room for divine involvement in creation. Deism, for instance, um, obviously holds that while God was responsible for bringing the world into being and establishing the laws by which it operates, the laws of nature now function without the need of further divine involvement. 
Now, while deism never actually gained widespread support, the assumption that science has displaced God and rendered God redundant is commonplace in contemporary Western culture. So there's work to do in the conversation between science and theology on how we may speak of divine agency in ways that both respect the causal regularities that science investigates and yet upholds the biblical conviction that God is at work sustaining all things by his power and directing them toward their proper end in reconciled communion with him. Doug Gunton's contribution to this conversation lies especially in his insistence that the creator, sustainer, and perfecter of all things is the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. How does this help? It's in the work of Irenaeus again that Gunton finds the conceptual resources to speak of God's relation to the world. Irenaeus's theology forged in opposition to those heresies grouped under the name of Gnosticism is an exercise in thinking through what must be said of the world and of God in the light of Christ. What must be said, first of all, in opposition to the Gnostics, is that the material world is good. Gunton explains, if God in his Son takes to himself the reality of human flesh, then nothing created and certainly nothing material can be downgraded to unreality, semi-reality, or treated as fundamentally evil, as in the Manichaean version of Gnosticism. The incarnation demonstrates, furthermore, along with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that this world that we inhabit is the terrain within which God brings about his purposes. The relation between God and world is therefore to be thought through Christologically, and as we shall see, also pneumatologically. It's in the light of Christ also that Irenaeus affirms that God creates out of nothing. If it were not so, God would be constrained in his creative work. He would be, in Irenaeus's words, a slave to necessity, and his omnipotence would be compromised. The notion of omnipotence sometimes raises concern for those wishing to uphold a scientific view of the universe, for it suggests in the minds of some a capacity to interfere arbitrarily in the workings of the created order. But that is not at all how we should think of omnipotence. We should instead understand the term in the light of Christ. For Irenaeus, the omnipotence of God signifies that God does not stand in the need of other instruments for the creation of those things which are summoned into existence. His own word is both suitable and sufficient for the formation of all things. Now this reference to creation through his word gives a first hint of the theology of mediation that Irenaeus develops and which Gunton himself considers to be crucial to understanding God's relation to the world. As is well known, Gunton writes, Irenaeus frequently says that God creates by means of his two hands, the Son and the Spirit. This enables him to give a clear account of how God relates to that which is not God, of how the Creator interacts with his creation. Now, two points are of particular interest here. First, God's involvement with the world is personal involvement. God needs no intermediaries. His creation of the world, along with his involvement in the world's redemption and final reconciliation, is undertaken in person through his own word and spirit. Irenaeus says, It was not angels who made us, nor who formed us, nor any power remotely distant from the Father of all things. For God did not stand in need of these beings in order to the accomplishing of what he had himself determined with himself beforehand should be done, as if he did not possess his own hands. For with him were always present the word and the wisdom, the Son and the Spirit, by whom and in whom freely and spontaneously he made all things.'" 
that's Irenaeus. The second point deriving from Irenaeus' conception of mediation as revealed through the Incarnation is that God works within and according to the conditions of created existence rather than against them. The word becomes flesh and dwells among us and so takes on the full reality of creaturely existence. God's involvement with the world does not take the form of arbitrary disruptions of created reality or violations of its order. I'll have more to say in the final section of this paper about how we might think of miracles in this light. And while creation is spoken of by Gunton as the work of the triune God, and while in all things the Father, Son, and Spirit work together, it is the Spirit in particular who is described in Scripture and in the Creed as the giver of life. The Spirit is the one who animates creation and breathes life into the creature. Whatever the details of the evolutionary mechanism by which life has come to be on this earth, life is said in Scripture to be given and sustained by God. That life the Spirit gives is not mere biological existence, however. It is life in all its fullness. Taking his lead especially from the 4th century theologian Basil of Caesarea, Gunton speaks of the Spirit as the perfecter of creation. Paul's talk of the gifts and fruits of the Spirit also bears upon this topic because it speaks of the Spirit working to enable human beings in particular to become what they were intended to be by God. The fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on, along with the gifts of wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, etc., are gifts and fruits enabling the full realization of our humanity. This work of the Spirit is not a violation of our freedom, nor of the laws of nature, but the operation of God within the conditions of created existence in order to realize his promise that the creature shall have life in all its fullness. So those are the three essential elements of Collins' doctrine of creation. It's creedal form, the idea of creatio ex nihilo, and creation by the triune God. So having surveyed these elements, I'll now briefly highlight four points concerning the relation between science and theology that emerge from Gunton's account of the doctrine of creation. The first is merely a, a recapitulation of a point made already. The Christian doctrine of creation, as Gunton has shown, establishes the conceptual conditions under which scientific endeavor may get underway. Chief among these is the divinely established order and intelligibility of the universe and the accessibility of that order to human inquiry. That includes the empirical and rational inquiries of science, but not exclusively so. The order and intelligibility of the universe is accessible also through artistic endeavor and in varying degrees through our daily experience as creatures given the responsibility of stewardship of the creation. That divine calling and appointment entails that we have the capacity, also God-given, to understand, at least to some extent, the workings of the world. The endeavours of science are further supported by the biblical insight that neither the world nor any part of it is divine. It has its own particular being and integrity, and so can be investigated on its own terms. We saw the importance here of early Christian thinkers like Philipponos, who insisted, in contrast with the surrounding culture of antiquity, that the heavenly bodies were made of the same kind of matter as earthly bodies and were subject to the same kinds of law. It's unfortunate that isolated incidents of tension between scientific and ecclesial authority have obscured the very substantial contribution that theological claims about the nature of reality have made to the progress of science. Gunton's work helps us to recover 
a better sense of that contribution. Second point, theological and scientific explanation. We've seen the appeal Gunton makes to the Irenaean metaphor that God creates, sustains, redeems, and brings the world to perfection through his two hands, the Son and the Spirit. This is a theological claim, and as we have been reminded, it is a statement of belief rather than a product of empirical investigation. What relation does such a statement have to the kinds of statements about the world that emerge from the sciences? That the universe got underway with the Big Bang, for instance, or that biological life has evolved through the natural selection and gradual mutation of species. The first thing to note is that theology and science, though both concerned with the nature of reality, are not rivals, although they can and often have been presented as such. The disciplines of theology and science involve two different kinds of judgment about how reality is constituted. Both science and theology are captivated by the order of things, and both venture an explanation. Theological explanations testify that because God is the author and sustainer of the world's order, and because the world is the outcome of divine love, that order can be relied upon to serve God's loving purposes for the creature. Science, for its part, investigates the material means by which that order has developed and through which it is sustained, and so offers, through observation of the natural world, its own complementary assurance that the order of things can be relied upon. So confident has science become of the reliability of the world's order that it happily speaks of the laws of nature. This assurance of reliability and consistency in the workings of the universe makes possible a vast range of human projects, some of them consonant with, but others antithetical to God's good purposes for the world. Theology proposes, as we've seen, that the very logic and the order of the universe, its reason for being and the purpose to which it is directed, are revealed most especially in Christ. To put it in the language of the Apostle Paul, Christ is the one through and for whom all things came to be and in whom all things hold together. But it's in John's Gospel that we see the most profound expression of this theological conviction. The Gospel begins, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. Then in verse 14, an extraordinary claim is made. This Logos, this word, has become flesh and lived among us. All of the order that science discerns, the constancy and the reliability of the workings of nature, has its basis in the Christ we encounter in Jesus of Nazareth. It is through Jesus that we may discern to what purpose creation's order is directed. As John's account of Jesus' life unfolds, we learn that the order of creation is directed to a particular end. That end is fullness of life for the creature in communion with God. What has come into being in Christ is life, John 1, 3 to 4 tells us. Or again in John 10, 10, he has come that we might have life and have it abundantly. The wondrous workings of the universe that science so impressively investigates are directed to this end, that the creature may have life in all its fullness. The gospel tells of the various ways in which humanity has chosen death rather than life, and of the disruptions to the created order brought about as a result. That story takes longer to tell than we have time for here, but let us note that in John's Gospel especially, Jesus' ministry involves the restoration of the creation to its proper purpose. His turning of water into wine at Cana in Galilee, for example, 
is a restoration of divine blessing, re reversing the tragedy spoken of in Isaiah 24, 7, when the earth was barren, the vines had withered, and there was an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. The healing of a man born blind in John 5 is the overcoming of those disruptions of creaturely life manifest in sickness and disease. The feeding of the 5,000 in John 6 demonstrates the sufficiency of the earth's fruitfulness so that, as God intended, there is food enough for all. And so on. John offers us these signs that God is at work in Jesus, setting the creation again on its trajectory to fullness of life in Christ. We can trace as well through John's Gospel the workings of the Spirit, who is the giver of life. And all of this comes to its climax in the death and resurrection. Death represents the severest disruption of God's good purposes for the creature. But in the Spirit's raising of Jesus from the grave, even death is overcome. Now, none of this is a rival to scientific explanations of the world. The theology of John's Gospel speaks, rather, of the underlying logic and purpose of the workings of the world that science investigates, and so provides the framework within which all human endeavours, science, culture, art, and industry, may be properly understood. Third point, God's involvement in the world, a non-competitive account. God's involvement in the world through word and spirit enables us to develop a non-competitive account of divine and creaturely agency. An objection to divine involvement in the workings of the world, made famous especially by David Hume, is that God's involvement in the world, especially through what we call miracles, necessarily involves a violation of the intrinsic order and integrity of the natural world. Hume defined a miracle accordingly as a violation of the laws of nature and argued that such violations are so improbable as to be safely discounted. And the argument is extended by some to suggest that science has shown that miracles cannot happen. The assumption being that we can have a regular and ordered universe or we can have divine action in the world, but we can't have both. Now, there are several problems with this line of argument, not least among which are the problematic definition of miracle as a violation of the law of nature, and the conception of God as a remote monad who might occasionally interfere with the workings of the world. The argument against miracles in the Humean tradition pays no attention, moreover, to how God, in fact, exercises his agency through the Son and the Spirit. The exploration of Gunton's doctrine of creation has helped us to see that the order of creation, its inner logic and reason for being, is established and sustained and will ultimately be brought to fulfilment by God. That logic, or logos, in and through which all things have come to be, has become incarnate in Jesus. In that light, we can see that Jesus' healing miracles, for instance, not a, we can see Jesus' healing miracles, for instance, not as a violation of the laws of nature, but as the restoration of God's intended order. The Creator intends that the lame shall walk, the blind see, and the poor hear good news. Far from being a violation of the intrinsic order of creation, these acts of God are a restoration of the divine ordering of things. They are the gift of new creation, setting right the disruptions to creation's order that have scarred our fallen world. The spirit poured out at Pentecost, likewise, does not disrupt, but renews creaturely life, thus enabling humanity, particularly in this case, to be directed to its proper end, to become what it is intended to be. According to the Christian doctrine of creation, the so-called laws of nature which science helps us to understand and respect are established for the sustenance of creaturely life. They are not violated, but in fact upheld when through the work of word and spirit, God inaugurates the kingdom and sets about the work of new creation. <clears throat> 
The non-competitive way in which God acts in the world may be further demonstrated by a couple of biblical examples, both of which Gunton refers to in defence of the point I am making. An important but often overlooked feature of the account of creation given in Genesis 1 is the permissive nature of God's creative word. We strike at verse first in verse 3, let there be light. But notice especially its import in verse 11, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind. And in verse 20, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth. Gunton points out that parts of the earth are empowered to serve as mediators of God's creation of other parts. Worldly agencies are enabled by divine action to achieve their own sub-creating, not in the absolute way that God creates, but relatively as creation from what already is. The earth and the sea are summoned to bring forth life by natural processes, we might say, but not without God's enabling. Again, this account of things does not speak of the violation of nature's laws, but rather of creation's divinely established capacity to share in the generation of life. It thus becomes appropriate, I suggest, to speak of divine action and natural law operating together in the evolution of creaturely life. A second example of non-competitive divine and creaturely agency occurs in the conception and birth of Jesus. Mary responds to the angelic annunciation that she will conceive and bear a son with the, learn, with the words, let it be with me according to thy word. Mary's response is in fact the proper response of all creaturely life. It's the tragedy of human sin that we so often seek to foist upon the world a word and an order of our own making, often with catastrophic results. Human sinfulness, it turns out, rather than divine action, is the true threat to creation's goodness and order. Returning to the biblical account of Jesus' conception, it's noteworthy that it is the life-giving spirit who fashions the child in Mary's womb. Gunton comments, in shaping from the clay of earth a body for the sun, the spirit enables this part of earth to be fully itself, to move to perfection rather than to dissolution. The point of the doctrine of the virgin birth, Gunton adds, is to link together divine initiative and true humanity. Jesus is within the world as human and yet as a new act of creation by God. The spirit in this episode, as elsewhere, works with rather than against the conditions of creaturely existence. Now these biblical and theological claims are not empirical claims of the kind that science can confirm or deny. But neither do they represent a threat to the scientific view of the world. They indicate rather that the fine-tuned order of the universe about which science tells us so much is the framework within which God is at work, bringing his purposes for creation to completion. And now finally, one more brief point, the context and telos of scientific endeavor. The Christian doctrine of creation involves, as we've seen, strong claims about the end or telos to which creation is directed. That telos, the fullness of creaturely life and loving communion with God, is revealed most especially in Jesus, who with the Father and the Spirit works to overcome the threats to that telos posed by human fallenness and by creation's bondage to decay. Theologically understood, this history of creation, redemption, and final fulfillment is the context within which all creaturely life and all human endeavor takes place, however much we may fail to recognize or to acknowledge it. That it is so, nevertheless, requires that we consider the degree to which our creaturely endeavors share in or frustrate the working out of God's purposes for the world. There are ethical questions to be considered here. We must ask, for instance, about the degree to which our science serves the well-being of all creation, about the degree to which our industry is used for healing 
and for ensuring that the, the divine provision for the flourishing of creaturely life is accessible to all. We must ask whether the alterations we make to the fabric of creation conform to or disrupt God's good ordering of things, and so on. Our best efforts in science and in theology should therefore be dedicated to understanding the workings of God's creation. Just as in Paul's vision of the church in which all the gifts are needed and all parts of the body have a role to play, wisdom in such questions as I have just outlined requires the combined insight of all scholarly disciplines and all modes of human understanding. It requires as well sustained and prayerful attention to the word and spirit of God. So I've tried to show in this paper that Colin Gunton's articulation of the doctrine of creation reveals the possibility and indeed the necessity of respectful collaboration between science and theology so that we may live well in the world that God has made. And to live well means to share in the reality of God's creative and redemptive purposes for the world as they are being worked out through the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin, as usual, with some questions. If I could put you on the spot a little bit. Uh, your lecture reminded me of a pastor friend who provocatively I'm not certain how seriously he said that Prozac is sanctification. And I think that that question really does get at a, a lot of the issues that we're trying to wrestle with because, um, and you didn't name it as such, but I know Gunton talks a lot about the relationship between creation and redemption. Mm -hmm. And your uh, lecture did talk a lot about, about, a lot about um, creation as the redirection of, uh, so redemption is not just something different from creation, but the redirection of it, the lame heal, being healed, et cetera. Um, so if, if yeah, I know we have pastors in the audience, we have counselors in the audience, um, it's a, very much a doctrine of creation question. Mm -hmm. um, one tied to your paper, how would you respond to the question? That, and sure. if, if you want to pass right now, we can go to another question, but how would you respond to the uh, um, Prozac is sanctification? Yeah, well I think um, my suggestions at the end of the paper were, were, were that we have to ask of all human technologies and all human interventions whether they serve or disrupt God's good purposes for the world. And since healing is demonstrated in Jesus to be part of God's restoration uh, of, or establishment of the new creation, um, drugs can certainly play their part in that. But what we have also to think of is whether it creates a dependency in the wrong direction, as it were, not upon God's life-giving spirit, but upon um, things we manufacture uh, for ourselves, whether it creates an ultimate dependency on those things. And that has to be thought through. Uh, I can't answer kind of in general terms about that, but it's one of the questions we need to ask. And I, th I appreciate your answer as well, which draws on uh, the interdisciplinary vocation that we have as the people of God, which is how you ended. So I, sure. I appreciate your answer. Do we have other questions? Yeah, it's, uh, down here, Alex Pierce. for a, a very helpful and clear uh, paper and quite illuminating. I think I'm really happy with um, much of the constructive angle and um, the applicability of what Gunton has to offer. The area I want to go to um, is sort of the villain uh, that comes out <laughs> in the paper. So um, to get there, it seems like he champions Irenaeus um, and, if I'm not mistaken, Basil as well, uh, Caesarea. Um, so, for example, uh, Basil agrees with uh, Gunton on um, God uh, using and creating through uh, the earth and the waters in Genesis 1, right? And his homilies on the Hexameron. Um, and uh, Irenaeus um, does posit a difference between the original and the final state. But I guess uh, a concern with Basil and Irenaeus, um, Origen shares the anti-Gnostic context that Irenaeus has and he actually, um, in, uh, in Periarchon 3.6, agrees with Irenaeus that there's a difference between the original and the final state. And then with Basil, a more important point, I think, um, is that Origen and Basil understood material creation to be a training ground, a school, um, through which God um, brings uh, souls back to himself. And so I, I guess I wonder, um, 
if origin is the right sort of uh, foil to maintain in this in this narrative. Um, and I wonder if there's just uh, in in Gunton. Um, uh, a lack of clarity about some of the uh, more complicated parts of the reception of origin. So I'd love to just hear if you think that has any impact. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, as I was writing this paper again, I, I was went back to or, origin to look again. It did strike me that origin actually is ambiguous <laughs> on some of these matters. And you could offer a more charitable reading of origin than Gunton does. Um, nevertheless, I think there are some risks that Origin takes that we need to be wary of. Um, and it does seem to me in Origin, the training ground of this material life is actually directed towards our ultimate escape from it and res res restoration to a kind of spiritual existence. That, I think, is problematic because it casts suspicions ultimately on the goodness of the material world. It's something, a, a kind of expedient for the meantime in uh, as we progress to something higher. Now, that risk that Origin takes, I think, does need to be guarded against. Quiet crowd right now. John. Thank you again for your lecture. A uh, quick question on miracles. You mentioned how um, uh, Hume talked about it being against the laws of nature, and you're advocating more of a restoration of, the, of nature as it was intended to be. Um, how would you deal with miracles in scripture that seem destructive or chaotic, um, especially involving aspects of nature like storms, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. that go contrary to maybe what we would think is uh, nature operating as it should? Um, I might need to ask you for an example of a miracle that's destructive or chaotic, but certainly there are uh, miracles that Jesus engaged with that involve the kind of subduing of nature in some way, the calming of the storm, for instance, the walking on the water. Um, The storm that destroys his family, uh, even uh, the woman turning into the pillar of salt, uh, mm -hmm. like the, um, Sodom and Gomorrah. So, I mean, different destructive uh, miracles. It's a little difficult to give a general answer, I think, because every text of scripture needs to be examined carefully on its own terms to try to understand what's going on there in terms of the kind of literary um, motives that are being. Uh, used here. Um, there, is, there are ways of talking in scripture that invoke metaphor and hyperbole and so on. So we need to examine each one uh, on its own terms. But I think I'm, I'm content with my general claim that the way God works in the world is to bring about his good purposes through word and spirit um, in, within the conditions of created reality. Um, and that, well, we go back to Augustine here, actually. Um, he did say, Augustine said at one point, that miracles are not a violation of nature, but a violation of our understanding of nature. Um, and this certainly is the answer that God gives at the end of Job, for instance. Um, God doesn't explain all that has happened, but he questions the limits of Job's understanding of what's going on. And I have to conf confess limits to my understanding of what's going on uh, in some of those areas too. But I, I want to uphold the general principle, nevertheless, that God, God's action in the world is always to bring about his purposes within the conditions of, of the created order. That's perhaps not a very satisfactory answer. We need to look at particular instances carefully, I think. Back, Brad Dunlock. Thank you. You make me want to read Gunton. I'd never heard of him before. And uh, that I've was wonderful. I've something at least. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm hearing, uh, not only in Gunton, but in some of the other uh, theologians we've been learning about, uh, lots of references to the church fathers uh, very positively, that is, um, 
their affirmation of the goodness of material creation and so forth. Well, what does Gunton do with the asceticism of the patristic period? Um, he doesn't like it. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, at least not in so far as it indicates a kind of disparagement of the material world. Um, Gunter is not at all sympathetic uh, to that. What he would approve, however, is the restraint that we ought to show um, in terms of uh, a kind of greedy appropriation of the blessings of creation. Uh, Gunton is certainly sympathetic to that, and insofar as the ascetic tradition seeks to guard against that, then that's something to be commended. Can uh, you join me in thanking Murray Ray for his lecture as Christoph and Stephen? And if, if Stephen and Christoph can make their way up here, please.